Coming up on this week's Fast TV, we're at Dooney's Rare Breeds Farm near Aberdeen and we catch up with key speakers from the Rare Breeds Survival Trust Conference held at Bow House earlier this year. Well, hello, I'm Alice Lennox and um, I work with the RBST as a volunteer. I have done for going on 15 years now and my involvement with the RBST came about because I come from one of two um, RBST approved conservation farm parks in Scotland. So I come from Dooney's Rare Breeds Farm. We are one of two RBST approved conservation farm parks in Scotland and we sit on 120 acres of land just opposite the North Sea and we have everything from horses, pigs, chickens, goats and cows, all rare and native from the UK. Rare breeds are important because they not only represent the heritage of our landscape but also they can graze outdoors all year round without any other feed inputs. They're hardy, they are fantastic with them um, looking after young, they don't need massive feed inputs, they're fantastic with rearing their young, they often don't need problems, uh, you know you don't have to call the vet out that often either and um, they're really important for the changing face of our agriculture moving forward in the future. Uh, so at home we have um, quite a variety of rare breeds, we have Golden Guernsey goats, now these goats are amazing because they were almost wiped out during the Second World War. One lady managed to save them and um, from that they've, they've been built up again. We also have our grey-faced Dartmoor sheep that traditionally graze the Dartmoor moors. And we have our Eriske pony who are fantastic. They're from the Isle of Eriske. Unfortunately, they became rare because they used to carry peat um, and other such like things from the, the shore up, up to the farms. and with the onset of mechanical sort of, you know, mechanizations, they weren't needed anymore. But they're fascinating because they're actually born black mostly and they turn white when they're older into adulthood. So we like to call them the magic pony. <laughs> we have the Oxford Sandy and Black Pig. It's one of the rarest pig breeds in Britain and it's nicknamed the Plum Pudding Pig because of its markings. And we have the Clydesdale horse called Hazel. Obviously Clydesdales in Scotland go hand in hand with the, uh, the canals and uh, she is just a, a lady of leisure. 2023 marks the 50th anniversary of the Rare Breed Survival Trust, a brilliant organisation supporting native rare breed livestock across the UK. Back in March, farmers, crofters, smallholders, policy makers and industry stakeholders met to discuss the future of farming in Scotland and explore how we can feed the population whilst meeting our biodiversity and net zero targets. Well, I've been really delighted to be here at the event today and the 50th anniversary of RBST. And the focus of my speech was really about the important work that they do in really preserving some of the most rare breeds that we have in Scotland, our native breeds, but also talking about how important that work is when it comes to climate change and tackling climate change, and as well as enhancing nature as well. We're currently in a climate and nature crisis, so it's important that we're doing everything we can to try and tackle that. And I think that the focus that, and the work that RBST does is critical to in how we tackle that going forward. We published our vision for agriculture last year, which set out that we want Scotland to become a global leader when it comes to sustainable and regenerative farming. So we're going to be bringing forward a new agriculture bill this year, which will set out the future framework for support and how that's going to look now that we've left the EU and we need to deliver a new framework for that. So there's certainly a lot of work going on at the moment, but some of the, the critical things that we're focusing on as part of that is that we want to produce more of our own food. We want to produce produce that more sustainably and there isn't a contradiction. I think, I think sometimes it can be made out that there can be a contradiction between food production and tackling climate and the nature crises but you can do that in a way. You can produce food that tackles the climate, that works for nature and it's really key that we focus on, on getting that point across to people. Our native breeds in Scotland are so important in terms of what we can do to, to tackle the climate crisis and to enhance our nature and biodiversity too. So that's where the work that RBST do is absolutely invaluable in that and why I'm really keen to continue working with them is we look to try and develop solutions that are going to help us tackle these crises going forward. So I'm Nikki Oxall. I work for Pasture for Life as Head of Research, but I also farm with my husband. We run Grampy and Graziers in Aberdeenshire, and I'm also a PhD student uh, exploring nature connectedness for farmers as part of the agroecological transition. 
The session was about um, biodiversity and the role it plays um, in farming. And so there was a lot of discussion about biodiversity and functioning ecosystems. But I think a lot of questions from the audience were really focusing on carbon, which was a really interesting kind of perspective for us to be exploring. Well, biodiversity is uh, you know, the, the richness and the, the variation of, of organisms within any ecosystem. But it's important because nature doesn't act and behave in monocultures, you know, nature is a polyculture and the more that we can reflect that in our farm systems, the healthier those systems are going to be um, and the more effective and efficient our farms are going to be in producing food but also ecosystem services. I think in 2040 I'd like to see far more efficient farms and I think we need to move away from this idea that efficiency and intensification are the same thing. They don't have to be the same thing. We can have highly efficient, low input um, farms that might be considered extensive but actually they are knowledge intensive so I think efficiency is a measure that is definitely something we can aim towards without thinking that means putting loads of ruminants in sheds and pumping them full of concentrate feed um, there are other ways of, of creating efficiency so I would like to see farmers being far more um, financially literate understanding their cost, cost of production um, and understanding where those profit margins really are and how to best achieve them. Um, so I think that that profitability comes alongside the environmental aspect and I would like to see far more diverse um, swards within fields and far more in field measures. So rather than pushing nature to the hedges and edges, how can we actually make our in field decisions better support nature? Well, I think Regen Ag is developing in, in its kind of understandings and, you know, there's a lot of work going on in the research space about what is regenerative agriculture and there's some kind of fairly basic principles around increasing biodiversity above and below ground, increasing biomass, um, maintaining a living route, reducing soil disturbance, integrating livestock into arable systems, but actually a lot of the research is starting to show that regenerative agriculture is about how you organise your decision making around those principles. So it's not really the practices that you undertake, but it's understanding the justification as to why you're doing them and working towards a set of goals that create more efficient um, and abundant farms. So I think that is where Regen Ag is really going. It's not just about, oh, I'm doing min till, but actually thinking more systems wide about the farm and how to shift some of that productivity um, into a lower input system and actually getting natural systems to do the heavy lifting for us on our farms. I think all food should cost more. Um, I don't think that the food that we buy in the UK is, is valued and I don't think the true costs of food are reflected in what we pay. But I recognise that within a cost of living crisis that's a difficult, um, that's a difficult argument to make. However, Food poverty isn't the issue, poverty is the issue and so these issues are not really something that sit in the hands of farmers to solve. This is about systems change, this is about fairer societies, um, which is a tangent that we could probably go off on at some length, but actually how do we make our societies fairer and more equitable so that people have more money to spend on better quality food. I'm Robert Ramsey, I work as a, a consultant for SEC Consulting at AIR, working out of the Auckland Crew office. I also so I do a lot of general work and a, a bit of kind of more specialist livestock type work as well. Also in my free time I'm at home farming, uh, running a beef and sheep unit where we've got 40 cows and 300 ewes, so it's quite a nice, nice job to keep my hands in, to keep my hand in at, at both jobs. I always say I couldn't do one without the other. So today's session was all about the farm of 2040. So I was thinking about 2040 on the way here today and realised it's basically the midpoint between I went to uni 17 years ago when I was 17 and we're talking about 17 years from now. So interesting discussion today. I think the key points were positivity, you know, whether there is a, a exciting future for the industry. It's obviously going to be different to what it is today, but I think it's also important to think that 2040 it's only 17 years, eight years from now. Looking back, 17 years doesn't seem that far. So it's going to be different, but we're going to have to uh, we're going to have to adapt and change things as we go. But the industry will still be. I think we've got a very vibrant future in front of us uh, and lots to shout about. Yeah. So we discussed what our kind of ideal would be. So what does a farm a farm look like in 2040? The answer is we don't know. You know, 2040 is in the future and we don't know what challenges. Just look back a few years, we don't know anything that's coming in the future, but we do, I think we can have a stab at what farming looks like. So it's going to be different. We've obviously got challenges when it comes to 
a people, so recruitment of people and getting new people into the industry, we're going to have to do things differently. And I think for me, collaboration is the key, doing things together. So working together for, for mutual gain uh, is going to be a big part of it. We're all obviously going to have a big, a strong focus on the environment, on climate change, and also on food security. So by 2050, we, the world's going to need 60% more food than it's producing at the moment. So we, as farmers, have a, a, a complex job of work to do that involves reducing emissions, so producing more food from less, but also dealing with biodiversity crisis and dealing with uh, all sorts of other things that we deal with as farmers. But I'm absolutely certain that farmers will rise to the challenge. I'm concerned that we, we as farmers, we're running very compl complex businesses with a lot happening. We've got multiple traits on the go at one time. We're producing food, we're dealing with, a, we're looking at emissions, we're looking at climate change, we're looking at a biodiversity, we're local, local economy, supply chains, all types of things on the go at one time. At the moment, we're under a lot of pressure when it comes to our carbon emissions, and I, and I wholeheartedly believe we, we do have a, a significant job to do there, and we do have to all engage with that climate change discussion. However, chasing one trait, chasing one metric is a very dangerous thing to do. If we look at where the dairy industry have been, and the, even the poultry industry as well, if we chase for yield alone, we get yield and lots of other things fall off. So in the dairy industry, we, had, we, we focused on yield. Um, using the profit index, we were chasing for one metric, and we had fertility issues, we had lameness issues, we had whole structure issues for cows. Many of them have now been, or all of that has been addressed by looking at the whole rather than just the one part. And I think that's where we are in the climate change discussion for farming is we're focusing down entirely on the carbon discussion where we really need to look at all that we do as farmers whilst all buying into the fact that we have to do something about carbon emissions as well. The does size matter question was an interesting one today. I went down that, obviously it's a very broad question, and I, I went down that from a cow size and, and resource use efficiency perspective. And for me, looking forward, the cow of 2040 is going to be much more, I think, or hopefully more efficient than the cow we've got today. Uh, and to do that, I think the main, the main driver is to reduce the size of the cow. What we need to do is balance that with the size of what we're trying to produce as well. So we, we need to find those cows that are capable of, or those genetics that are capable of having a low mature weight, but also rapid growth rates. And so we're needing to look at curve bending bulls, but does size matter? So the conclusion from today was, yes, it does. As part of the Farm Advisory Service, I'm really lucky to present a a monthly podcast called Stock Talk. So it's a, basically a livestock podcast uh, where we talk to a lot of interesting people across the industry, actually across the world now as well. So um, the last episode we did was actually with Martin Beard, who's uh, heavily involved with the Rare Breed Survival Trust and, and was the one of the main organisers for this event at Bowhouse today. So yeah, really, really interesting to chat to Martin. And, and, and it also, so I'm a probably profit focused a business consultant and farmer and it's always interesting to come to these type of events and see where the passion for the more primitive breeds and rare breeds and, and the value of that is and we as an industry have got we must value the diversity of genetics that we've got and diversity of breeds that we've got and that's where the rare breed survival trust does so, so much good work so i had a really good chat with a uh, martin on that podcast and also another good chat with him today and, and looking forward to seeing what else we do today. So uh, yeah, exciting times. My name's Rosie Jack, I'm the Bowhouse Manager. Um, so I oversee all of the businesses that are based here, um, but also all of our events and market weekends that we host as well. Um, and also how we're connected to Balkaski Estate, which we're situated on just now. Our topic today was uh, the future 2040 farm and what it might look like. So we were talking about things of what we want to see in the future and things we don't want to see in the future. So things we want to drop um, and good practices, practices that we want to take forward. If I had the, the looking glass, um, I'd love to tell you, but I think it, the good things we need to see and we need to take forward are, uh, I think, our transparent production processes. So showing our consumers exactly what we're producing, what we're making, and letting them make choices on the products that we're producing. 
Um, I also think it's about education, so bringing young adults, young people out to the farm and showing them what we're doing so that they're possibly looking at careers in the industry um, and taking that forward as well. I think it's um, also about where possible dropping red tape. I mentioned that, that lots of small producers that I see come to the markets really struggle with the rules around dairy production, dairy products and meat production as well. There's so much red tape for small producers to navigate that it's really difficult for them to even get off the ground and start. So there's kind of pros and cons that we want to see going forward um, but I think it was a really good discussion. Personally I think mass, mass production of things. Somebody, I don't know where I got the wrong end of the stick, was talking about doing one thing and doing it really well. I actually kind of disagree with that because I think we've seen in the past that if you put all your eggs in one basket, that things can go wrong and there's no coming back from that. If you only did one thing and did it really well, if something was to change, then you, you virtually have no way to pivot, people like to say, but I think that's really important to, and especially on a farm to have good biodiversity, which we've talked about, having lots of different ways to use the land, I think is really important to, um, to make sure your soil health is well kept and that you have multiple, multiple routes to market as well, yes. I kind of think there's different ways to look at it. You can look at it in the actual the makeup of the land and your your structure of soils and that sort of thing, the science behind those things. But for me, it's about um, the businesses as well and bringing people to to understand and allowing space for businesses to have production space and things like that. So biodiversity is, to me is the breadth of a farm, everything from your soil to, to farming practices as well. So it's kind of all encompassing and it is a huge topic, but I think practices from uh, from basically your consumer down to your soil health, I think that it covers everything, to be honest. It's maybe not the technical term of biodiversity, but that's what I think of. I'm Fiona Burnett from SRUC and welcome to this uh, crop health update for the Farm Advisory Service. We're moving into a period of thundery, quite warm weather at the end of June now. Um, and there's really quite a lot going on health-wise in crops. So we're in a crop of winter wheat, um, which is still looking relatively green. But some of the wheats around the country have really suffered from that very dry period we've had. Flag leaves are beginning to roll and we're moving towards harvest. But even though we had that dry period, there's still quite a lot of disease in the winter wheat crop. So you can see yellow rust on the tips of these leaves here, and that's really quite typical around the country, quite a lot of rust. And that septoria that we had overwintering in that warmer winter still kind of nibbling away at the crop. The wet weather as well is really ideal for head diseases. So the key action in wheats would be to do your mycotoxin risk assessment. And some of that will be driven by your local rainfall. So those local dumps really increase the risk of, of those head diseases. For the spring barleys, they went into later drilling um, because of that very wet March that we had. So we then moved into a drier April and May, which might have limited the amount of ramularia that we'll see in those crops, which that disease doesn't like dry conditions. But we've still got bits of disease in the spring crops as well. So quite unusually, little bits of yellow rust and brown rust coming into spring barleys right up to the northeast of the country. Um, small amounts of rhincosporium as well. And again, hot humid conditions such as we've had um, really shouts potato blight. So for the potatoes out there, um, we know that we had the first blight periods at the beginning of June, those Hutton periods that mark high humidity and high temperature. And we've had a couple more since the beginning of June, so it's quite likely we're going to see blight in crops um, quite soon. And, you know, we're in a period of very rapid growth. So for the potato crops, pick those um, blight fungicides that really are good at moving into that, that new growth.